Hello ladies and gentlemen, Nick here and welcome to my reaction to Doctor Who Season 1 Bad Wolf slash Series 15, uh, 15, that's next series, Series 14 slash Season 40. Season 40, yay! Okay, um, I'll do a Season 1 Bad Wolf slash Series 14 slash Season 40 retrospective or discuss it more in detail in the reviews slash ranking at a later point in time. Um, but <laughs> season one, Bad Wolf, um, wasn't quite as brilliant as we were hoping. It was, it was good, it was great. But I think there's something that the 60 specials had, and even Church on Ruby Road, that's sort of missing here. I don't know if that's because it's those with the 60th specials and the Christmas special and this is the series and it's been a few months later. But I don't know. I think there's some sort of spark that's missing from season one that the 60th specials and Church on Ruby Road had. And we've kind of... It's kind of gone. Um, bar maybe a few points of great... I mean, we got of course, we were all excited for the series before it started. Um, Boom is very popular, and I would say Rogue is also fairly popular as well. So I suppose the spark, there's some sparks here and there, but I don't know. There's some sort of something that's gone. It doesn't feel as exciting or as, as amazing, other than when Boom had a lot of fans about it. I suppose just seventy three yards to a lesser extent, and all and the ending of Dot and Bubble and the excitement of the build up of Legend of Ruby Ro uh, Ruby Sunday. And the cliffhanger. But there seems to be some sort of spark that's sort of not quite been here that there was at the in the specials. I mean, we'll see how it goes next series. It's probably nothing. It's probably fine. I'm probably going to keep getting used to this like I did with the 13th Doctor's era. Well, that felt quite different. And series 11 felt like, okay, this is not quite... This is something I like. I'm liking it, but there's not quite. It's very like I suppose it's because it's different and all. And then once by by the time series twelve came around, I was like, okay, I'm used to this um, new era. I'm used to this style. And then the series eleven rewatches for the revisitation reviews were like, yeah, like not really a huge. I mean, it's different, but it's not. But it's like I don't feel the same way like I did in twenty eighteen. I'm like I can just sit back and watch this like I can any previous era of the show so I'm probably going to feel the same way about this season in a few years time a couple more seasons have come out I'm a bit more used to it and I'm going to sit back and say yeah this I can watch this just like I can watch classic who like and watch series 1 to 10 and now series 11 to 13 so I can probably say like yeah fine I could probably sit back and just enjoy the ride regardless of how I felt at the time Okay, so that's, uh, that's my season one feelings for for the season as a whole. Um, okay, that's for Empire of Death. Right, so I'm going to split it into emotionally and story um, risk reaction. So reaction-wise, on an emotional level, I'm going to start with um, Ruby's mother reveal, which is towards the end of the episode. So if you don't want to know about that, stop watching. This is major spoilers. Okay, it's okay, almost major spoilers. Um, first of all, it's not a major character, so like no Susan, no Thirteenth Doctor. Like some people are speculating for some reason, no Trickster, no Susan Triad, not Mrs. Flood. We still don't know much about her, but we could probably make a couple of guesses about what she's currently doing, and we'll probably find out more about her next series. Um, it's not anybody else we know, and it is a new character, but it's not like a mis like they're not too mysterious. It's, uh, basically, it's an ordinary person that they just couldn't find for the longest time, and they seem to be like a nice person. And they got Ruby out of there because they were young and in a bad spot, and where they were living was a bit wasn't quite safe for baby Ruby, so. Uh, leaving her on the church was the safest thing to, for her to do, even though there was like not even a note, let alone any way to find the parent. Um, but 
it was a good reveal. I did say in the at the end of the previous video with the speculation of it being a brand new character that they should de dedicate most of the episode to fleshing out said character if they were going to introduce it. But um, what's happened is like they just kind of they really reveal it at the end. But it feels fine. It feels natural. My only question is how the heck couldn't they find her? Um, Ruby's mother and father actually they then find her father as well um, although we don't see him yet um, my only question is how did it take so long there is I have the theory that Mrs Flood could be some sort of guardian angel or guardian something she could easily be a villain next series um, like she's had, like she's giving me Missy vibes like Missy started off seemingly sort of benevolent seemed to be a nice person earlier on in series eight but then as of the time she started to lean more into like maybe she's not so nice and then in the series finale of course she was revealed to be the master so it could be a missy thing where she like she seems to be the good person but it could all be part of the bigger scheme and she could easily turn out to be a villain she certainly seems to have some sort of godlike power and knowledge that could be affecting things and if she's the one who actually has the can um, ability of snow as implied towards the end it could be her who was the one protecting ruby across time and space or have some sort of place uh, placement in place so ruby is kept safe or something as we've seen in the previous episodes uh with the the song from the church because there's definitely something there that wasn't fully explained here and that is that or suit or because Sutek wanted to find out the identity of Ruby's mother because it can't stand not knowing as much as the audience um Sutek is basically a member of the audience in this episode <laughs> um <coughs> excuse me as in it like it wants to know um Ruby's uh, mother's identity which is why it's keeping her and the doctor alive um so I guess because of that, maybe it was keeping Ruby alive so that it would find he would find out Ruby's mother's identity. So it's either what whatever Mrs. Flood's done or what Sute or something Sutek's done to give Ruby sort of the ability to make it snow. Just by off chance in as we've seen in the previous episodes. Um Yeah, hopefully that'll be explained next season, Russell. Hopefully. Because this series, this ending does feel like a little bit, um, doesn't feel like it's answered all of the questions. But since we're saving some for next season, I suppose that's fair. It's just that there's a few kind of like plot holes here and there that may get answered at a later date. But are for now not answered. It could be deliberate. It could be part of a plan. But we'll see how it goes. This, this series finale does sort of give me series five finale vibes in that similar sense where they built up lots of mysteries over series five and they answered a good chunk of them in the finale actually they actually did probably the best explanation of what's been going on in the season finale of the matt smith era i mean they did a few like the other finales did that and time of the doctor of course wrapped up a ton of things but i think series five's wrapped it up the best but left the door open for further mysteries for series six to explore and series right, the plan was probably for series seven to do the same but um things changed to be more focused on the 50th and standalone stories and there might have been the possibility of matt smith doing a fourth series but series eight ended up being peter capaldi's first due to a and time of the docks was his uh was smith's last so i mean whatever the plan was initially series five was at least a good build up to most of it answered a good good chunk of it but left the rest for future seasons um i think that's what's going on here but uh, what season five series five season five of uh the revival um by the way the this is going to get this whole numbering re season renumbering thing is going to get three times as confusing for those who say the revival series is series one to 13 if they say their seasons one to 13 as well on top of classic who seasons one to 26 and the bad wolf seasons so like so if i say season five if i say season 5a 5b and 5c then that's um season 5 60s season 5 2010 and season five a couple of years into the future um which means season 6b now no longer is um well now season 6b can be referred to either the season that takes the second second doctor expanded media stories set and multi-doctor stories 
set after the war games but before, before Spearhead in Space, and Series 6 from 2011. Yeah, <laughs> it's complicated, isn't it? Well, blame whoever decided to call Series 1 to 13, Seasons 1 to 13, as well as Classic Who Seasons 1 to 13, uh, Seasons 1 to 26. And that's before even Bad Wolf renumbered this lot of seasons as seasons one onwards as opposed to series 14 onwards so like this has been a this has been a problem for a while and it's got it's on triple complicated because of the name the season numbering change so yeah actually that is a point a friend of mine on the universal's discord did say that the season numbering thing was completely pointless and i totally agree this season doesn't feel like a complete fresh start it just feels like series 14 um like if if this was series 14 it would feel like yep that makes sense this is totally fine it's like restart of the era um sorry new new era 15th doctor's run and 14 for the specials but it's still carrying on from where we left off with 13's run and it's just like yep fine whatever um but because it's called season one which is probably because of the whole disney deal and they're, they're starting again but it doesn't feel like season one it feels like series 14 season 40 um possibly because it says a lot more uh references and callbacks to past stories particularly especially with the finale being so so tied to pyramids of mars from season 13 of classic Who, season 13a um we will call it season 13b is flux and season 13c is the season 13 of the bad wolf that we may get to in the future Ooh, that would be season 26 of since the 2005 revival, making 52 seasons. Lovely. The, an even 52 total. Ooh, but we've got a long way to go now for till we get there. We're, we're only on season 40 um, overall. Um, but you know, how great would it be to get to season 52 overall, which would be season 13 of this lot and series 26 since 2005? How very lovely that would be. That's for the that's for the mid twenty thirties to deal with. If we're, if we're going to get annual seasons, that's for like twenty thirty seven, I believe, or twenty thirty six. Yeah, twenty uh, twenty thirty six or twenty thirty seven. Um. Anyway, yeah, it would be twenty thirty. Yeah, thirty six. 2036 um for season 52 if this sticks to being annually um but that's 52 overall but um yeah because because this season has a lot more calling back to previous stories especially pyramids of mars in this finale and devil's called tying in with the giggle from the 60th and those 60th specials a being very highly tied to series four of the revival, season four B, or as and or having a lot of callbacks and tie-ins to previous stories like the Celestial Toy Maker, references to Flux, um, Mel returning from this um from Trial of a Time Lord in season twenty-four of a class uh, twenty three classic twenty-four of Classic Who. Um Yeah, so this like season one um Bad Wolf, season one C is heavily tied to the specials, which are heavily tied to previous stories, specifically Celestial Toy Maker Series Four and Series Thirteen. Um, and because of that, this season doesn't quite feel like it's a brand new, fresh start like season. And also, the Fifteenth Doctor, the Bi Regeneration, and the Giggle, even if Church on Ruby Road is the fresh new start for him, but. Uh, yeah, this is definitely this is this is less of a fresh start than season one, the very first season, or even series one, season one B, for the revival, uh, which was which had a few references to the to the classic series, but it was mostly brand new, fresh standalone for the brand new audience and the brand new audience perception of the series for that year, and then series two they could start weaving in a few more classic elements like Sarah Jane tie in to shows. And the brand new Cybermen, but referencing the older ones as well. And then Series 3 bring back the Master and the Macra. I mean, series 1 did have the Autons, but you could easily go into the series um, without having the prior knowledge of the Autons. Whilst the Macra are a bit more of a niche villains, I suppose, the Autons as well. But they're sort of pretty perfect for 
as season seven classic who showed were pretty much a perfect monster to introduce a new doctor's era and even a soft reboot of the of the series like they did with john pertwee's run so um that, that's it worked pretty really just as well for christopher Eccleston's. so yeah but the macro is more of a niche returning villain that was that's really cool for the, the older fans like oh my god i know those monsters from that second doctor story that's still missing but will be animated in about 11 years time they didn't know it was going to be animated 12 years actually um they didn't know it was going to be animated at the time but you know that's what um retrospective jokes are for like like we can make those little um humorous bits you know anyway moving on so yeah um sorry i've been rambling a lot um but yeah empire of death um yeah so on emotional level tying in with ruby's stuff i think it works it's a bit of a surprise i'm fine with it um we're probably going to find out we're gonna probably going to see ruby and her family a bit more next series depending on how much she's going to be in said series um because the speculation report about her Traveling with the 15th Doctor and the new companion played by Varda Safru. Some reports are saying she's only going to be in two or three or just a handful of episodes. So, um, we'll see. Um, it'd be cool to see a three-person TARDIS team for a few episodes. We could do that. But it's possible that we she could just be popping in and out with Varda Safru's character taking over for a longer stint. But Ruby's story will continue. I would honestly love to see the three-person TARDIS team, by the way. I'm loving the shooty Millie dynamic of the Doctor and uh, Ruby's friendship. And if her story still has to be continued, why not give her more episodes to expand said story instead of just two or three? Um, you've got eight episodes. If not, if it's not the entire, not all eight, maybe at least four or five. Uh, maybe have a few episodes where it's just the Doctor and Vada Safu's to be named character, I see to be named to be named to be revealed. Um, I'm not doing the Chris Chibnall style talking of as yet. Um, sorry, just got a notification. I think I know it's going to be about this finale. Um, I'm not going to do the Chris, Ch Chris Chibnall style of um, pronouncing as as yet un um, as yet unborn from Flux Chapter Three as yet untied unnamed. Yeah, that sounds so fucking stupid. Um, yeah, um, name to be revealed, basically. We'll probably find out nearer to Christmas, um, or at least in early 25, before the series starts um, airing. But yeah, we'll see how it goes. Okay, so that emotionally, I'm happy, I'm fine with the ending, I'm fine with the uh, mother reveal. As for the rest of the episode, something's off. I don't know what it is. Um, maybe the stakes are so high and they have to run away and hide and they have to try and do sort of this There's a bit about, um, Roger Up Williams from episode four and how he developed, um, DNA technology and now everybody was, um, it's compulsory to submit some DNAs, um, in 2046 or whenever by that time. Apparently this was a deleted scene in 73 Yards or one they didn't use and they just save the scene for later but um oh yeah it just it does feel like okay we've got to jump to the future to do this and all to be fair most of it is part of a trick for Sutek. they are tricking him because the doctor doesn't realize he's only letting them live so that he can find out the identity of ruby's mother because it's bugging him as much as it's bugging them and the audience um naughty naughty rottle keeping his cards close to his chest before the big reveal so, well i say big um the reveal but yeah something's kind of something's kind of off with this episode it introduces the memory tardis which is a cool origin to where the tales from the tardis thing comes in still haven't seen the pyramids of mars version yet or the scenes with that one at least um so that's probably slotting in somewhere during this episode because they do watch some scenes of pyramids of mars on the tablet surprisingly the doctor doesn't say oh the guy with the curly hair is me when Ruby asks who they are, he just says, oh, some people I used to travel with, or used to travel in the TARDIS. He doesn't admit that the curly hair guy is him. Um, considering he likes to point out when he was previous people, previous incarnations, and Mel's in the room, she knows exactly what they're talking. he's talking about. She even um, 
fondly clutches as part of the Sixth Doctor's coat and Seventh Doctor jumper in memory of the two Doctors she travelled with. And yet the, the Doctor doesn't even do the whole, oh, that used to be me way back when. Interesting, I guess. I know Ruby isn't versed to the whole regeneration thing, but this could have been the time to mention it. I know this is an already got a lot of stuff going on in this episode, although it doesn't really feel like it. Um, but, yeah, I'm surprised they didn't do that. Especially since there's another companion in the room who does know, not only knows about the regeneration, but has now met four doctors, uh, six, seven, ten, and, sorry, fourteen and fifteen, and that's not even counting expanded media, where she could easily have met more. Um, actually, has she met more at Big Finish? I'm not quite sure. No, she does. She hangs with six and seven a lot. Um, as per usual, but I don't think she's met anybody else as far as I'm aware. She met the third Doctor in Dimensions in Time, so technically that's five Doctors, if you count that. And Rogue technically made that canon, so as much as, well, as much as Scream the Shouker, at least. Nope, Dimensions in Time is more canon, because it features the canon Doctors. Um... Yeah, that's just, okay, so if we count Dimensions in Time, five Doctors, and she's aware of the first two, fourth, which we also see in this scene, and fifth. So she's met five and is aware of at least another four. Um, and the fact that ten used to have that old, uh, 14 used to have that old face, so that's another one she, she probably is somewhat aware of. And thirteen. Of course, because they mentioned her in power. She's at the... See, okay, she knows... At, she's at least aware of several more on top of the four or five she's already met. So it's a surprise that neither of them say, oh yeah, that used to be the Doctor, the, that, that guy who looks like actor Tom Baker. A bit surprising there. But, you know, that's not really a big deal as much as I seem to have been implying. Um, but yeah, this... this I'm not sure what happened. It's some, something like, like like in Hellbent where like, like there's a lot of big stakey stuff at the start and then we kind of slow it down a bit for it doesn't not even so much for character scenes like the Big Bang did. Um but it just kind of there's a bit of a slow bit in the middle before the epic finale. Well, okay, this one's a bit more of an epic finale to Hellbent, but it's like the, it's a big the big climax, shall we say. So it starts off like okay, big epic stuff slows it down for, for in the middle for a bit of a diversion. Twice Upon a Time did this as well, by the way. Um, slows it down for a bit of a diversion and then comes back for the climax, which Twice Upon a Time somewhat had a bit more of a climax than Hellbent, but Hellbent was probably more on the emotional side for the characters, whilst uh, Twice Upon a Time included the historical event in, honestly, what was the best scene of that episode. Um, whilst here... It's somewhat like a, a... It feels a bit rushed, considering we had two episodes worth of build-up, but I suppose because episode one... Or episode seven, really, um, was more building up to the big twist reveal, etc. Um, but then this episode had to quickly do a lot of other stuff. We have Sutek's power, which seems to eradicate everything. We get, a, And then the Doctor, Mel, and Ruby run off with, in the memory TARDIS. And then we get this other planet where the Doctor gets a spoon from. You can you can't tell me you can find any spoons in that memory TARDIS with loads of props and costumes and trinkets from the last sixty years, That's including several consoles. Not one spoon, not even the twelfth Doctor spoon from Robot of Sherwood. Yeah, there, yeah, that whole scene there was probably there for some emotional scenes and. Maybe some universe building, but it does feel very much like an extended bonus scene. It feels really out of place. It could have been great for the novelization, but for the actual episode, I think it could have been cut. Um, if the, the episode's an hour, I believe. It's, a, it's the longest episode of the series besides the specials. Heck, I think it's even longer than two of the special, two or three of the specials. Um, I think the Giggles might be the only one that's longer, or maybe, maybe the Star Beast as well. Um, but it's definitely longer than Ruby Road and Wild Blue Yonder, and I think the other episodes of the series. 
And yeah, it's got this meandering scene where on the planet with like where it's a bit where the people forget uh forgetting and and the doctor gets the spoon. Like I said, you can find the spoon in that memory TARDIS of his, where he's got practically everything from the last 60 years. And we see this in the Tales from the TARDIS. Again, I would have watched the Pyramid of the Mars one, but the Tales from the TARDIS, and they shift it up now and again to for the rever relevancy of each doctor or companion who's hanging out in there. Uh, the, the Pyramid's one is probably this specific one. It's probably tied to that, um, to, this, to this TARDIS, because it's one there in a, in the episode and it's there it's them who's going to be in the pyramids tales but the other six are ta some of them are tailored to feature specific items or clothing from specific doctors runs like there's a lot of sixth doctor stuff for the vengeance and varus ones there's a lot of second doctor stuff from the mind robber for example so you can't say there's no spoons from any point in there not even like like I said, there's the Twelfth Doctor's Robert of Sherwood spoon. Where's that one? Or the Seventh Doctor's spoons? That's even feature in Tales from the TARDIS Curse of Fenric episode. They played it. Base plays the spoons with the Seventh Doctor. You couldn't tell me there was no spoon, let alone any metal of any kind, the Doctor could have used. So we had this meandering scene, which maybe it's important for later, but. It feels like it could have been fine for the novelization, but the actual episode it could have been cut. Um, yeah, and and, this, and when Stacey Tech wins, he's not really that much of a threat anymore. I think the biggest threat was him just turning up. That was his most threatening moments, and then he and then he kills everybody, including Unit, much to our surprise. But I was like, right, nah, they're going to come back at the end, aren't they? They're going to fix it, and sure enough, they do. They bring back everybody. Um, even the well, I'm not sure about uh, Harriet, but Susan Twist is brought back to life as normal. There's sort of like there's a revelation about her about and um, okay, Sutek hitching his ride on the TARDIS for a long time sounds like a good idea, but why only now has he decided to turn up right after after the events of the giggle during 15's run? Why only now has he decided to turn up and do all this shit? It's like saying, like, with the Division, why only at the end of Series 12, start of 13, are they now doing this? Why are they only now causing the flux instead of, like, back when, I don't know, the Doctor was Sylvester McCoy and was, like, the, the genius chess master, and they were like, oh, shit, he's going to figure this out. Let's um get let's get the flux rolling. Um, Or back during the Time War, where they were like, oh, shit, this Time War is majorly awful putting it mildly let's destroy everything and start the universe again Thanos style um or yeah and the same with Sutek why like he's been hanging on both TARDIS ever since Pyramids of Mars at, at the earliest although 1066 is reference which feels like more of a first doctor um story reference rather than um post pyramid so okay 1666 would make a lot more sense uh, see the visitation, but because I feel like the 1066 one is a time metal reference, uh, unless it's another one. The 1999 reference was majorly appreciated. Not only is it my birth year, but it's also the TV movie set of the year. 2005 was also thrown in there as well, <laughs> um, naturally. But anyway, if saying Sutek's been traveling on top of the TARDIS all this time since Pyramids of Mars. So he's been there ever since, well, just before the halfway mark of the classic series, which, if we had expanded media on, includes shit ton of Fourth Doctor onwards stories post pyramids. That's thousands of stories, and Sutex is riding on the back of the TARDIS all this time, including some of his own expanded media return stories, including a few Fourth Doctor ones. Um, and he's on there for the Time War. He's on there. For the modern series, he's on there for when uh, for the flux. He's on there for when fifteen duplicates the TARDIS. It must have jumped TARDIS so that he doesn't get stranded on Earth with the tenth, the fourteenth Doctor. Sorry, same Doctor, same actor, uh, David Tennant. He doesn't go and do garden parties with David Tennant in the Noble Family. 
he then go he goes off to travel with 15. So all this time he's been on the back of the TARDIS. I would understand he's been running on the back of the TARDIS for a long time, but since Pyramids of Mars, really? I thought it would be the fact that the TARDIS itself was being duplicated somehow caused him to infiltrate the second one, the the 15th Doctor's one, but even though the, it's been groaning ever since World Blue Yonder, so maybe something to do with the salt, which was apparently what let the toy maker out, but I don't know. So, yeah, Sutek's been on the back of the TARDIS ever since at least Pyramids of Mars. If not, maybe even sooner, if he managed to hop a lift long um, further back, and that maybe where that 1066 reference comes in. And somehow to jumped from 14's TARDIS to 15 when it was duplicated. And only now is he turning his E deciding to launch his um his Empire of Death. Only now. Like 10, 11 doctors, four, 12 doctors if you count the war doctor, 12 doctors later, 13 if you count 10 twice, because he regenerates into himself. So 13 doctors later, and now he's only decided to do it, just like how the division only decided, uh, well, rather, Tech Payun only decided to do flux after 13 found out about um, the division and uh, this truth, the timeless child. How only the silence decided to stop the Doctor in his 11th incarnation and not sooner. And how the time will only happen after the 8th Doctor, during the 8th Doctor's era, or towards the end of the 8th Doctor's era. And even though the, the build-up had been as far back as Genesis of the Daleks and could easily have started off after Remembrance. But then again, there was the Dalek Civil War in the 80s and early 90s, so... Well, I think it would be early 90s if it carried on, but... Yeah, uh, only then would they do stuff. Only then, and um, this is because of all the of writers coming up with ideas and stories and patchy, um, playing them around. But yeah, in the context of this story, after everything that's happened since Pyramids on Mars, if not sooner, if he did hitch himself onto the TARDIS at an earlier point before they met Sutek the first time, and only now in the fifteenth Doctor's era. Is he decided to like right? Okay, I'm gonna take over now. Was it the was it the whole not knowing who the mother was? Was it the whole duplicating the TARDIS thing? Was it the whole salt thing? <sighs> he didn't really say. He's just been on. I think I think it's implied that he hopped on board since Pyramid on Mars. It would make more sense if it was a later point and it's just been here for a long time and. Maybe maybe because the TARDIS was um, in trouble between the events of the Star Beast and World Blue Yonder, and he was able to latch on board, and then he goes on to the second TARDIS when it's duplicated. Um, or because of the whole toy maker stuff, he latches on between Giggle and Churchill and Ruby Road, and that's what causes, and then that's why Fifteen starts bumping into her. Something, some just something to explain it a bit more clearly. And whilst um, Sutek is quite threatening in the episode, he doesn't really do much. Not even his harbingers don't really do much. The, the kind of again, this leads to this um, another diversion when they go to the future with the whole DNA thing. Yeah, they, this does end up being plot important because they do trick him with the reveal, and then they're able to use that as a way to get him and um, eventually defeat him. But yeah, he just, off, once he's actually killed everybody. He's not actually that. He's not really that big of a threat. He's just kind of. He's he sent off his empire. Of, he started his empire of death. He's killing everybody. Uh, everybody's dead. So what now? Um, clever trick, I guess. But yeah, it just kind of felt a bit underdeveloped. I think maybe the cards were kept too close to the chest on this one. And yeah, I mean, I could probably tell that the Doctor knew Mel was being taken over when he was talking to her. I think he could tell, and he like we knew he would, he could tell. So he plan he had his put his plan into motion, but um, yeah, it just feels a little um, under underbaked. I'm not sure. And the defeat looks pretty cool. The visual effects department did a fantastic job. 
But it's kind of like hurried. It's I think it's hurried so that because A, Super didn't really do an awful lot in the episode, and he's B, he's super powerful, and which probably answers question A as well. Um, and C, so they can get to the emotional climax and ending. So yeah, by that sense, Sutex kind of let go, uh, let down a bit. And also, uh, they say in his giant dog-like form. So it's a bit of a shame they, um, for the whole episode. So it's a bit of a shame we don't get which cool visuals for the, especially for the ending. But it's a bit of a shame we don't get him as a more human-sized or slightly smaller-sized person with that cool outfit that he had in Pyramids of Mars. He keeps his um his full proper. Uh, size, uh, well, I say proper size, proper look, and his larger size involved, which makes him actually feel a lot more like a different character visually. I mean, I know some creatures look a lot different when they change from the classic series to the modern series. See this Lurian, for example. But, like, he's very different in terms of the looks. I mean, it's a bit like the dog sort of tie, uh, dog look ties in with Anubis and what he looked like, sort of somewhat like he looked like in Pyramids, um, his true form, but it's it's very significantly different from them. I suppose the um, the characters' traits are within, are, the, are similar, and Gabriel Wolf is amazing in the, with the voice. He hasn't lost a step, but it's yeah, it's a bit odd that they didn't even tr they didn't even try to do a smaller size version of the character. For a few scenes, um, even if they can get Gabriel Wolf on set in costume, but they didn't even have a small version of the dog creature we saw, which is a bit of a disappointment on my part and uh, for me, because I did kind of want to see that back a little bit, and now he's killed apparently, so um, probably won't see that again unless they somehow bring him back and again. Oh well, it's always expanding media. Um, so yeah, final thoughts. It's so Empire of Death is a bit of a strange but ultimately disappointing conclusion to the series, at least on the story level. On the emotional side level, it does a good job, but I think on the actual storylines, I think the stakes got too high too soon, and they kind of just wrote themselves into a corner and ultimately had to do a underbaked quick way to resolve the story before doing the emotional wrap-up so yeah and some stuff doesn't make sense some of it could be intentional for next series and future series There's other other stuff is probably plot holes for this actual episode let alone the story itself um as well as the series and it just comes from kind of like a bit of a... I mean, I have to rewatch both these episodes, as well as Dot and Bubble. I have to rewatch these episodes again to feel it and see how... And doing maybe a double build, seven and eight. But as it sits, it's a bit... It's quite disappointing. It's on... It's it's one of the weaker series finales. And I think the series finales have been struggling recently. Um, although I did really like, if I'm going to count the specials, I did really like Power, the Doctor and the Giggle. Um, even they have their problems, but I think they are the special finales of the last few years are the stronger ones. Um, like I loved series one to five's finales, uh, maybe less so for the end of time if I'm counting specials. But like series one is phenomenal, series two is brilliant, series three and four, like they kind of buckle under their own weight and have a bit of a cop out ending, but they're still fucking epic and the time's also pretty epic that one is a bit maybe is a bit more pretentious than the others but it still works as a good send-off for 10 even if he's a bit of a whiny bitch half the time fives is amazing a brilliant setup of epicness in the first half followed by a character driven and using your mind uh, using your brain in the face of impending doom finale in the final in the second part that's how you do a slow burning character driven final episode with a lot with a couple of stakes still there and a bit of Dalek action thrown in for good measure and a bit more excitement to keep the younger kids on board. Although as an 11 year old, I was still pretty damn on board with the character development stuff. So, yeah. Um, 
at, that's at the time of broadcast, and even more so since. So yeah, series five's finale was awesome. That was that was an awesome finale. And then after series five, they start struggling. Series six is starts off great, but uh, finale starts off great, but then it kind of goes the epic. Oh crap! This isn't going to be a single part re um, reaction. I'm going to have to take this downstairs to edit um, and put it up as an edit. Um, so this technically will be an edited reaction, but only to put the two pieces of footage together. Okay. Anyway, uh, past that, past that um, forty odd minute mark. For that so there might be a bit of an awkward jump as well anyway well the series six finale um started off great but about two about a third in kind of went downhill um didn't really pick up and it ultimately ended on a disappointing note as well um series sevens i actually think is pr a pretty great finale to be fair i think that one's a fairly good one but i think that's going to go middle tier if we were ranking all 14 um, 18 if you count specials um, finales. I think that would go middle. Um, and then we get... Uh, and same for Time of the Doctor as well. I, th I think that one has a lot of great ideas, but because it was crammed into an, idea into an hour and we had a lot of other stuff to do, including some awkward comedy and random shit um, to time with the fact it's a Christmas special on top of everything else, it couldn't quite... Didn't quite work with everything involved, but as a final story for the Eleventh Doctor, again, I think it worked. It, might, it just had a few things that it, it could have lost, and it probably would have been better. Or extend the episode, or make it a two-parter, so that you can have all of that other random shit in it. Um, like the Doctor being naked, and the, the whole church, uh, the church, naked church things, that those awkward jokes, the Weeping Angels being there for no reason... And the Christmas dinner stuff, even though it does have a lovely scene with um, Sheila Grant, I believe, uh, Clara's nan, who's fucking amazing, by the way. She should have come back more. She comes in, in Dark Water, more in a sec. But, yeah, she should have come back more. Um, Dark Water, Death in Heaven, again, starts off... Well, Dark Water is kind of is quite mixed and controversial. It has some good ideas, but it's very dark for Doctor Who. It would have thrived better in Torchwood. It's definitely up you know, that shows Ali or even class. Um, but other than that, it's a decent and a couple of other scenes like the volcano one um, and Clara's attitude you know, at the start, even before Danny died. Um, that, oh, that first couple of minutes before Danny dies and she's just going, shut up, shut up, shut up, shut up. As her way to introduce, like when he just answers the her phone call. That's not exactly very... No, he's not even natural or nice. Um, but Stephen Moffat liked to have his character say shut up a lot in his episodes of both Doctor Who and Sherlock. Um, it happens quite a lot. Um, not necessarily in a, in a rude way, they're just like, shut up. Like, <laughs> anyways, in that one's case, that was a pretty awful way to start the episode, though. Um, especially since Danny was going to get hit by a car after, right afterwards. Um, but yeah, that episode kind of like it was building up. It had its strengths, it had its weaknesses, it had that re the dark direction, but it had its it was decent build up elsewhere. Um, so despite what it ended up leading in leading up to with the whole don't cremate me stuff, it was still a decent setup episode despite a few other bad scenes. And then Death in Heaven basically crashed and burns the rest that whole setup. Um, something kind of happens here, but to a lesser extent. Um, but yeah, Dark Water, mostly good setup, even though there's a lot of stuff that doesn't work and some stuff is not good. And then Death and Heaven basically ruins every good thing that Dark Water was going for and crushes it along with all the bad stuff. A few decent moments like the Dr. Clara scene at the end, but most of it pretty bad. Hellbent in series is series nine soul episode finale. I'm not counting Heaven Sent. I'm not counting Heaven Sent and Face the Raven. It's Hellbent. Se Heaven Sent. Well, actually, that did the exact same thing series as series eight, except Heaven Sent is a thousand times better than Dark Water, and Hellbent basically ruined most of that. I could kind. Of, I understand where it's coming from, and I see points of views of its defenders and likers, but I'm sorry that Hellbent. Just it's it sucks. 
and I, like whatever it was trying to do, it failed for the most part. Like I, I get it, but I don't think it did it very well. I think it failed in what it wanted to do, and it took Kevin Sense amazing, almost per no, literally perfect episode, and made it pointless. Besides maybe the Doctor getting over his grief, but then what he does in Hellbent does it kind of makes that redundant as well. So, so what was the point of Heaven Sent if we were going to immediately go into Hellbent right afterwards? <sighs> Series 10's Thank God was fantastic. That was that like that one. I, I know I go straight over Series 5 and Series 3 and Series 4s and Series 2s to an excellent extent, but Series 10's. Like, there's a reason why that one, after Heaven Sent, came second in DWM's 2023 20, poll. Um, those two, Heaven Sent, the Series 9 penultimate story, and Series 10's two-part finale, World Enough to Time, Doctor Falls. They were the top two of the, of the entire show, with Genesis coming third, the top classic series. There's a reason why the Series 10 finale came second best of DWM's poll. It's fantastic. It's emotional. It's Stephen Moffat's big redemption, at least as far as series finales is concerned. Series 10, for the most part, is sort of the Moffat redemption anyway. But this one is like the crowning jewel. It's a shame Twice Upon a Time followed it, but we won't talk about that. But yeah, this, this two-parter was epic. This was emotionally driven. It's episode 1 uh, or 11, big character-driven story. Episode 12 is basically the Time of the Doctor, 12th Doctor edition, with Cybermen as the primary threat. And it was fantastic. That should have been the story we ended the 12th Doctor and Moffat eras on. Just put Sharda on for Christmas and New Year, and you've got that festive period covered. <sighs> oh, what? What a fantastic finale. And then after World Enough in Time, we've been struggling. Battle of Rangsko Avkolos was disappointing. It had, its, it had potential, but because it was a first draft, because Chiefs Tribunal was busy helping other writers with their episodes on top of writing five and co-writing another with another writer of his own episodes, that series. You know, maybe that's something that might have happened here as well. At least with series one... They had a little bit more time, so if Russell wrote eight episodes of that series out of 13, he's had at least had a bit more time with them. I say that, this this series had quite a bit of time as well, So and series 11, so I don't know what I'm talking about. But yeah, Battle Rangers Gore of Colossus ended up being a first draft, actually, so did some of series eight and seven episodes. But it ultimately meant that it ended up being an underwhelming finale. And Resolution special that followed it ended up being more of a finale to Series 11 than Ransko and Carlos did. The time, the attention of the Simon and the Timeless Children, meanwhile, on the other hand, was stuffed to bursting brim with too many subplots, too many storylines, too many supporting characters, and not even enough, not even a 65 minute finale and 45 minute or 50 minute um, part, first half. To make all work on top of all of that major character and continuity changing shit we got lambasted with, and nobody would shut about the shut up about how awful just having the fact that it existed ha, uh, last for a month and a half. Seriously, guys, it got so fucking boring hearing about it uh, midway through April, and all the whole I mentioned this before halfway through April, just the whole bitching about it got so bloody annoying and I was like, oh, for fuck's sake, the pa bloody pandemic's on. Talk of, like, you you can't get away from this, ter like, this bad continuity story reveal that doesn't work, but you can't shut up about it for five bloody minutes in the middle of a fucking pandemic, you... Ugh. This is why I prefer people like confused adipose but just more like speculating about how it could work instead of just bitching about it because like okay once the criticism's out the world criticize the episode be my guest and criticize how it's going to be it's handled when we get to later down the line where like talk about it but please for the love of god one and a half months later shut the fuck up <sighs> it's terrible but you know you don't have to go on about it for a month and a half right okay second rant in I don't know how many weeks ago the the other one was, but second rant in a uh, in a month or two about that. Thank God it's been over four years. Uh, we could bitch and moan about other stuff. 
and we're not in the middle of a fucking pandemic, so it's not even as bad. So, or it's annoying. So, anyway, so yeah, series 12 finale, shit. Even without that whole continuity change, and when that was added, that was just like another shit for show thrown on top of that. But you don't have to bitch about it for a month and a half straight with a big global event being forced on top of that. And we're like, oh my god, just get a bloody life already. Series 13's finale was... Um, I liked it at the time, but I feel like it because we were going to get Power of the Doctor later, the big centenary special... Um, which might have been, which would seem to be the big finale to 13's run. Something was kind of left taken out of the Vanquishers, Flux Chapter 6, and it didn't quite feel as a much of a satisfactory conclusion to the series. It was better than its predecessor episode. Um, I might even take it above once in future, but I think now, actually, now I might swap that round. But yeah, it is definitely on the weaker side of Flux, and it ultimately came to a bit of a disappointing conclusion. Again, the two Dalek specials that followed Series 12 and 13 actually felt like better follow-ups to those respective series, um, as opposed to the actual season finales. Um, with either the Daleks even feeling like Flux Chapter 7, Epilogue. Um, so, yeah, and... But, yeah, Vanquishers didn't quite... It, at least it, it wrapped up the Flux story, even though they did see leave some questions open and it still messed about with tying it with, like, the whole Doctor backstory. That was never going to get explained, after all. And Power further um, enforced that. But out of the 13 Doctors' three main series finales, that was easily the best... Um, or at least least worst. And then Power of the Doctor was an epic ride and romp. Yeah, it's got its flaws and a bit of a couple of story details that don't quite work. Same for the giggle for the 60th specials for the um but I think Power is definitely the best 13th Doctor finale. And it's for a special mini series rather than an actual series. Shit. <laughs> um, same for the 60th anniversary specials, the Giggle. I think that one was a stronger finale than this series finale, and um, <laughs> which is interesting. But um, pest flying around here, um, which is odd because um, yeah, it, it was again, it was great, it was amazing, and but it does have its flaws and uh, a couple of problems. But it was more solid than what we got this time round. Legend of Ruby Sunday, Empire of Death was a bit of a... It's built up quite a, really well in the first half and then kind of dropped the pool a little for the second half. Not as bad as Death in Heaven or um, or what Hellbent did or um, Doc, second half of Doctor William, not the one before, that Wedding of River Song. Um... And it's not a, it's it's there's a bit more substance to it than Ryan Square of Colossus. There's less shit going all on at once, like in Timeless uh, Ascension and Timeless Children, but it doesn't really re it doesn't it's certainly Russell's weakest series finale, including the specials, and it con uh, ex excluding the specials miniseries, it, it continues a trend of post series ten weak finales. Um, I'll even throw in the Vanquish there, even though I did give it a slightly high score, but that's probably got to go down now anyway. So besides the specials mini series, and even then they don't they're not perfect. Um, they're more f um fun and enjoyable on a fan geek out level than uh, critically good, but they're still the stronger ones post series ten. Um, but yeah, since series since series ten. The actual finale, not twice upon... I, I probably would throw in twice upon a time in that sense as well as for the Doctor's run. But since World Enough of Time, Doctor Falls, excluding the, 20, the 2022 and 2023 specials uh, miniseries, is, the finales have... It plus twice upon a time as well, in that sense, haven't been very good or have been a bit on the weaker side at the very at the best, like Vanquishers and this two-parter, and then on the weaker side for the other two. Um, and before series 10, we had a bit of a, this problem as well with series 8 and 9 and a bit of series 6. So, 
I don't know what's been going on post series 10 and to a slightly lesser extent since series 5 because series 10 was epic and the series 7 and time the doctor okay to a lesser extent time the doctor were pretty good um which names are really good time take out a couple of other elements it probably would be a lot better um but it's, i still consider it pretty good but series 6 8 9 and then every series post series 10 except the specials mini series is for 22 and 23 have been struggling and like i don't know why what's gone wrong with this what's gone wrong with doctor who finales outside of the specials where not including twice upon a time of course uh where because that one basically takes series 10's amazing finale and basically it's the twice it's the hell bent of series 10 um takes the previously amazing story and kind of does a bit of a doo-doo on top of it but it's twice twice upon a time knows when to stop do doing and is that allow and allows its predecessor story to stand on its own two feet without do doing on it too much whilst hellbent basically takes a massive do do on top of heaven's and it does not apologize for it um but yeah i don't know what's gone what's going on with the finales they've kind of been a bit weak since series or at least under the unsatisfactory except the specials they've been a bit unsatisfactory if not pretty weak post series 10 and less and to a lesser extent since series 5 I don't know maybe series 15 season 2 bat of battle season 41 overall will be will have a better series finale next series um I think season openers are on a similar level to be and actually no season openers um season openers are fine um the private space bit space bit is still my week, least favorite episode of the series um, actually, that does tie into my series current ranking would be Space Babies, then this episode on its own. Then, um, it's going to be a four way actually between Devil's Core, Dot and Bubble, M uh, Boom, and um, Empire, sorry, Ruth, Legend of Ruby Sunday because I thought Legend was really pretty good at the time, but I have to see what I think on a second viewing. Same for Dot and Bubble, um. And tying it in with Empire of Death, it probably would take Legends down a few places. Meanwhile, Boom, I enjoyed a lot more on a second viewing. And I think Devil's Court's a fun story. So I think further viewings of those episodes, and I will probably have a bit more defini de definitive list. Currently, I would say Boom, Dot, Legend, Devils. But Legends could even... But those could all swap round. I could end up liking Dot and Bubble more than... Um, Devil's Chord, Boom would might shot up a bit. Uh, Legend could go down and join Empire on retrospective and go below Boom. Um, if I included the 60th specials, I'd probably throw in Star Beast around this area as well, and it probably would end up sandwiching a couple of these stories. Then we get to the Giggle, then Church on Ruby Road. 73 yards, I'm going to say, is my second favourite of the series, and then Rogue ends up being the top one. I think that one was the most solid episode, even though 73 Yards was a really great experimental one. And counting the specials, well beyond the remains king of the current era. And Destination Scarrow would also go above Empire of Death as well. So that would go below that those um that four way, five way if I can, if I added the Star Beast, although once those episodes store are uh, lined up, Star Beast would have a more permanent place, I think. It would be Destination Scarrow, Boom, Dot, Legend, Star Beast. But again, and then Devil's Chord. Um, actually, no, Devil's Chord, Star Beast, then Giggle. But I think then, but like I said, I'll probably move some of those around on later viewings of Dot, Legend, and Empire. And then further viewings of all of the episodes um, of the series again. But yeah, um, in terms of the overall stories, Legend is brought down to empire's level or at the very least um yeah actually no yeah i'm not i'm gonna not i'm putting it below boom um i know i wasn't as big on boom as everybody else or almost everybody else at the time but you know that one was was that was better that was better so yeah that you guys can have that one and like i said some of the other ones are gonna move about in the future as well who knows dot and bubble could become a favorite um or it might just go slap bang in the middle but uh, yeah, this is phenomenal. Maybe I appreciate it more. Maybe it will go lower than Space Babies even. Um, but yeah.
overall Empire of Death not the best way to end the series. It's not the worst one, obviously. Like Hell Bent is still worse. Um, Timeless Children is worse. Death in Heaven is worse. Ranscore of Colossus is worse. Wedding of River Song is possibly worse. Um, I'm I'll get back on that one. Um, but it's definitely not any. Be it's definitely not better than series one to five's finales, including the end of time. Name of the Doctor. Probably I'm going to throw in time with the Doctor as well. Um, series 10's finale, that was fantastic. And even series 13, and also the special miniseries, is the two of, that followed. Even Vanquishers, I would say, was a stronger final episode. Maybe Legend is better than that one, but um, overall, like, if I was putting the two episodes up against the Vanquishers on its own, it's maybe on a similar level, if not Vanquishers is just a bit higher. So... Yeah, I mean, Flux itself would probably be higher anyway, as the whole six-parter, but... Yeah, I don't know. It's odd. Like, I suppose Empire Death kind of comes nearer to the middle of the ranking, but it's still on that lower end. Like I say, it's definitely, like, Series 1 to 5, 7 and 10, and all four specials, miniseries, including Time of the Doctor, which is probably the weakest of those four. And like I said, I'm possibly even considering Series 13's finale going above us as well. Um, and definitely for the standalone individual episode, um, Vanquishers versus Empire of Death, definitely, yes. Um, but yeah, but it's definitely better than, um, Death in Heaven and Dark Water, if count, which is the whole story. Um, Hellbent, Battle of Ransom, Grav, Coloss, uh, Sunshine of the Sign Men and, and the Timeless Children, or just the Timeless Children going individually. And possibly the Wedding of River Song. If not, maybe that one's just above it as well, like the Vanquishers is. Um, but at the very least, Wedding of River Song would be better than Empire. Not so, not as good as Legend. And same for uh, Vanquishers. But I think that they were on a similar. I think this one's on a similar level to Wedding River Song, and the Vanquishers. Um, so yeah, we're in the middle. But like I said, the best ones are series one to five, and ten. And then seven in the sp oh, and then seven in the specials mini series, um, all four of them. So yeah, it's def so we definitely got at least what is that six? So seven series, uh, one to five, seven ten, and then the mini series. So yeah, eleven series and finales are above this one. Possibly thirty, possibly twelve or thirteen. Mm, twelve at least, at least twelve, um, at least eleven, maybe twelve. Revenge of River Song, excuse me, Wedding of River Song on a similar level. But definitely better than the other eight, nine, seven, eight, oh dear. Um, definitely better than the other four. Okay, uh, okay, out of 18, that's not really that good. And even more so out of 14, if you don't count the special ones, because you've got like seven or eight, maybe nine in front of it. But like I said, I'm gonna to have to rewatch these episodes, and like, and Legend was so fun and such a great um, first part. But this episode, I don't know, it just didn't quite feel the same. It didn't feel the same, and yeah. Hopefully, season two, series fifteen, season forty ones will be even better. Oh, and don't ask me to rank all of the classic series season finales in this rank in this video. I might do a. A separate ranking at a later day for all of the season finales from season one classic to season one Battle of the Wolf, season 40 overall. But like, and the classic series, they could they always they, they were just uh, they didn't really build up to the series finales for the most part. They were kind of like whichever stories they decided to put last in the production block. Some of them were finales, like the Plants of the Spiders and Logopolis for the and the war games for the regenerations. And Trial of a Time Lord, of course, that was building up, and Key to Time, um, season 16, um, with Armageddon Factor. And I suppose the Tom Baker six-parters were, felt more finale-esque, because they were the six-parters. But for the most part, classic, besides of the regeneration stories, and the multi-story, the multi-story or multi-episode storyline, they mostly felt like whichever story they felt like putting last in the production block. Or whichever story they felt last on the story order. Especially in the 60s and 70s. Like the 60s ones. They they 
the production blocks would even cut an episode or two and save it for the next season and just end it on right this story this is what one will end it on um reign of terror and uh, time meddler for example and then maybe they go a bit more structurally sounded later on but ultimately it was whatever story they decided to end the season on besides some bigger ones like war games and logopolis which serve as regeneration stories the end of the era or stories with a bigger continuity going uh, storyline like Key to Time, Season 16, and Season 23, Trial of Time, or being an entire season long story. So that one definitely had, to, that one was the most finale of them, probably, Season six, season 23. Even Season 26, the final, ep the final story, was probably like, um, that was probably just one they decided to go on. Curse of Fenric which feels like it would be a fantastic season finale, was actually going to go first. And they swapped, they moved it back. Ghost of the Galaxy, season 25 finale, was going to be the second story. Silver Nemesis was going to wrap up the season. They they had to delay Great of the Galaxy. So, and pushed the middle two, pushed Happiness Patrol and Silver Nemesis forward. So, yeah. Classic series, it didn't really matter as much, apart from ones like Key to Time, Season 20, and Trial of the Time Lord, or if it featured a regeneration at the end. That didn't even happen all the time. The Case of Andrew Zani was one story ahead of the finale, and they ended up with Six Doctor's first story. So, and Hartnell's regeneration was an extra story added onto a story pushed back from Season 3 into 4, and then they gave him one more story as a final story to go out with before handing over to Patrick Troughton. So, it doesn't even work on that sense. I suppose Season 4's finale does kind of work, I suppose, as a final story. But even then, Tomb was pushed back to Season 5. Um, I don't know if the Dominators was pushed back from Seasons 5 to 6, but We in Space... Actually, see, We in Space leads into a repeat of Evil of the Dark, so... Uh, like, some of them work better as finales. Some of them are just kind of the last story of the season. Um, so, yeah, like I said, um, the, the regeneration, the three final regeneration stories for Doctors 2, 3, and 4, and season 16 and 23's finales are the most finale-esque feel of those seasons, and then everything else is usually whatever was decided to be the last story of the season, um, whatever was placed last in the blocks. It's only really been from series one onwards that they've actually had dedicated finales or final stories uh, wrap up the season. Heck, even Battle of Rhine Square of Coros feels like it's that one of those classic series esque. Like this is the last. Like yeah, it's got ties in with the first story and character arc stuff in it, but it does feel like that is the that it does feel like this was the story we decided to put last, basically before the New Year special. Um, and we just we just have the same villain from the from the opener to say, oh, this is how it ties in with that, and this is how we make it the last step, the finale finale esque um feel when the character arcs that are wrapping up over the series. Yeah, I mean, it's Ransquad Collins, I suppose, feels the most like the most classic series finale in that sense, but um, not in ter in terms of tone, just in play in terms of placement in the series rather than anything else. But yeah, that's that's a good example of that, as opposed to building up to a lot of a big uh, revelation, like like Russell T Davis did so well in his first era, or Stephen Moffat for the most parts. Um, okay, I say the most parts about um, half the time. Um, even even Chibnall to a lesser extent later on, but uh, yeah, I had a, anyway. So yeah, don't I'm not gonna. I'm not going to rank the classic season finales in this video with the Revival and Bad Wolf ones because there's so many of them and most of them are just the last stories of their seasons, bar a few exceptions that specifically the regeneration and over and long season long story or season long arcs finales or maybe a few that feel a bit more like a, a, fin a final story of the season like Definitive Stock but uh, like say Green Death for example or Inferno but yeah, most of the time it's the regeneration stories or the ones that actually end the season or the finals of the season-long arcs or season-long story um, for seasons 16 and 23, respectively. 
and survival to a sort of lesser extent because of it being the final episode of the show, but that's more retrospective than at the time. Uh, anyway, so that's that's it from me. Thank you for watching. I'm going to go down and put this into here, Premiere Pro, um, put the two footage pieces of footage together, render, export, and then upload it as one video, um, but otherwise unedited. So, uh, so technically, it's an extended unedited uh, video. It just has to go through some editing software first in order for it to be one video instead of two, if that makes a lot of sense. Okay, so that's it from this reaction. This is a very long reaction. It's almost as long as my recent Earth Agents episode. No, it's longer. Um, it is as long as those some of those older reviews for Series 3 and Series 12's finales. Blimey. Right, well, I guess the uh, the actual review for Legend of Ruby Sunday and Empire of Death is going to be a lot longer then. <laughs> or a lot shorter. Uh, we'll see how I go. Right, well, I'll, um, thank you for watching, and I'll see you guys next time. Um, take care.